Welcome. I'd like to uh, welcome you all to the second in the ATSI Agricultural and Food Forum a series of webinars um, on the general topic of uh, climate change adaptation and carbon neutrality in food production. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands from which we meet today. Today, I'm joining you from Wurundjeri land uh, within the Kulin Nation uh, of uh, the Yarra Valley and Melbourne. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who will join us online today. Welcome. As we share and discuss our knowledge and practices, we acknowledge the deep knowledge embedded forever in the custodianship of country. This uh, second in the series of carbon neutrality seminars by at Ag and Food Forum uh, will address what the Agricultural and Food Forum regards as the most significant challenge uh, that agriculture will face in the next 30 years to 2050. Uh, that is the adaptation and mitigation uh, of climate change. We view it as both a scientific, technological, economic and social challenge. Today, we move on from the first webinar uh, where we discussed really just the reasons why Australia's peak agricultural industry body, the ENFF, uh, has set and accepted a 2050 carbon neutrality target and then the technology that might be required to do that. Today, we have two outstanding speakers who are going to, we're going to move to the question of how we might do this. And in that, we've, uh, we have Alexander Gartman and Peter Grace. Alexander will talk uh, from a banking perspective uh, about both how the banks regard climate change and how they see the necessity to mitigate the risks uh, and perhaps what products the Benigo Bank uh, is considering developing in this area. Peter Grace will then begin to look at some of the technological challenges and risks that are involved in uh, particularly in relation to soil carbon in the mitigation of climate change. Now to introduce the speakers. Uh, Alexandra Gartman is uh, the Group Executive Partnerships, Marketing and Corporate Affairs uh, and CEO of the Rural Bank within the Bendigo Bank. Alex, of course, is no stranger to rural Australia. Having served as CEO of the Birch Cropping Group for a decade, which is one of Australia's leading farming groups, and later as CEO of the Foundation for Regional and Rural Renewal. She was recently appointed to the, as the chair of the Victorian Agriculture and Climate Change Council, she is a trustee of the Helen McPherson Smith Trust and a director of the Australian Farm Institute. Peter Grace uh, is a professor of global change at the Queensland University of Technology. He is an internationally recognised soil science just specialising in the long term productivity and sustainability of agricultural soils. Peter has lived and worked extensively, not only throughout Australia, but also throughout the Americas, Africa and South Asia, and is an adjunct professor of Michigan State University. Peter currently advises the Federal Government Department of Agriculture on the role of soils in climate change mitigation, and is currently the Australian representative of the Cropland Research Group under the Global Research Alliance for Agricultural Greenhouse Gases. A quick word before I ask Alex to begin about how, what the, the ground rules are for this webinar today. 
Uh, we have asked Alex and Peter to talk for about 15 minutes and we hope that leaves 20 to 25 minutes for questions following uh, their uh, presentations. Uh, in questions, uh, because of the large numbers, over 160 registrants to this, you will have to ask questions through the Q&A function. And uh, John Dixon, who will, joins me as a moderator today, and I uh, will probably amalgamate some of those questions where they're similarly, very similar topics to allow, uh, to avoid sort of duplication in our, from our presenters in their answers. Uh, to remind you all, this webinar is being taped and uh, after some editing and uh, approval by the speakers, will be available on the Ad ADSI website. And we will be recording all the questions as well. So uh, now I'd just, I'd like to ask Alexander to give her presentation. Thanks, Alex. Great, thank you very much, Snow. And um, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm coming to you from central Victoria and Jaja Wurrung country, and I also acknowledge uh, elders past, present and emerging. Now, um, I just thought I'd briefly just outline you know, a little bit about the bank. So Rural Bank is the agribusiness division of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank Group, and we are focused solely on the farm business lending. So I will have a, a specific uh, focus on the agri side of things here. We don't lend into the corporate agriculture and we don't really lend into the sort of hobby farm activities um, through the Rural Bank Division. And we partner with community banks across the country and also partner with pastoral house elders. And so our staff are often embedded into those local branches and offices. So what I wanted to cover today um, is really about what's happening across the banking sector in relation to climate change and what the banking regulator is indicating will be be required from a compliance and reporting perspective. Now I'll talk mostly to the Australian sector, but I will also touch on um, some of the approaches in the EU, which gives us some insight to where our regulators may go. And then of course, I'll share a bit about what the Bendigo and Adelaide Bank are doing and our approach and some of the challenges um, that we're experiencing. So hopefully that stimulates a few thoughts for our Q and A. So, um, it's sort of stepping back and, and talking about the industry, pretty much all banks are talking about climate change. Um, but I'd have to say there's a bit of greenwashing in there uh, as well, because we know that we're expected to talk about climate change, but we don't always have deep capability and knowledge uh, internally. So sometimes we talk about things, but we're yet walking the talk uh, across the industry. There certainly were announcements last year about lending to heavy emitting industries and, and where different banks were going. And recently, I'd say there's some really positive announcements about incentivizing climate and wider ESG practices as part of lending. Now, larger banks have been working for some time on climate and environmental actions with smaller regional banks and credit unions following up being sort of either fast followers or really sitting back and, and listening and learning from what the big four have been undertaking. So if I um, talk about the sort of how the regulator um, and what banks are having to uh, respond to. So APRA is the Australian financial system regulator for banks, super, superannuation funds and insurers. And their mandate is to ensure banks can meet their financial promises, primarily deposit holders um, within a stable, efficient and competitive financial system. So that's really the purpose of APRA. Now, they've recently issued a draft prudential guidance, which is CPG 229, on climate change financial risks for industry consultation. And the guidance outlines the regulators thinking on how banks should approach climate change risk and opportunities, including things like governance and oversight, incorporation of climate within risk management frameworks, completion of scenario analyses to assess financial impacts to banks for, for any given climate change scenarios. And on that topic, um, APRA with the four majors and Macquarie are currently collaborating and completing a pilot climate vulnerability assessment. And that's likely to address which particular climate change scenarios will be used and then consistently used by all banks uh, in their modelling. 
and also testing the source of climate change data because there are there's a plethora of data sources available and that will help inform how banks should treat climate risks within their capital management plans so that we still have a stable financial system now it's anticipated that all of the banking industry participants will benefit from the learnings generated by this pilot climate vulnerability assessment and so that means that climate change risk has been or is being incorporated into uh, banks group risk management frameworks that they are undertaking risk and opportunity workshops across um, their portfolios to try and really have more granular understanding of what their portfolio risks and opportunities are um, and undertaking scenario analyses and some of you would have seen uh, some scenario analyses published by particular institutions so Banks are really going to be regulated by what scenarios they plan for. And they'll be doing that really at a large portfolio level. They're not going to do it so much at a you know, individual business level, uh, but very much at their portfolio level. So they'll think about different industry sectors. They'll think about different geographies and be um, testing um, and running those stressed scenarios of future climate change um, across their books. We're also all being subject to shareholders and their expectation of how climate risk is managed and what climate action uh, they want to see the institutions they're investing their capital into uh, take. And of course, there's, there are other stakeholders that are putting pressure on you know, banks responding appropriately to uh, the topic of climate change. And that includes staff who expect to be employed by a good corporate citizen, customers who expect banks to meet their needs, but don't always want banks to be the ones that tell them what to do. So I've got, you know, when I think about our financial system, um, I, banks will certainly be able to manage the risk. Uh, so if there's enough insight and data to be able to apply to their portfolios, um, they certainly can account for lots of different scenarios. But these will all have various capital and cost implication and consequences. Um, and that, I think, is what we have yet to really work through. Will banks be able to support some of the opportunities that climate change presents? Um, I think that's something to be tested because banks, um, we all associate them with managing risks. They're not always well set up to think about, well, how do we make sure we proactively support the opportunities? Another question is, is there going to be enough capital? Yes. There's definitely enough capital um, to be able to support um, adjustments and changes and uh, transitioning to a low carbon economy. If I can just touch briefly on the EU. So the, in the EU, we are seeing that um, environmental social governance compliance, that ESG compliance, is really starting to be driven via financial institutions. And what those banks and financial institutions are expected to do is to be able to account for the ESG uh, uh, performance of their clients. So banks are now asking clients, or will be in the EU, to report on their climate footprint and actions, their, uh, you know, their broader environmental actions, social impact and, and governance. And that includes things like appropriate employment law, um, you know, social ramifications, uh, natural habitat impact, climate. Um, and they, the banks will be expected, if they're listed on the uh, EU exchange, to report on that annually. So that really is um, driving it, you know, the financial institutions to, to get a lot more information from their clients about their own uh, impacts and performance and to be able to report that uh, very transparently. We anticipate that, you know, the EU approach will be closely watched around the world um, and our regulators may follow suit. Um, I think there is just one, you know, one challenge when we think about incentivising or regulating uh, actions and behaviours. We sometimes get the perverse outcomes when they are driven by a compliance requirement as opposed to thinking about climate change being something that we need to respond to, to to ensure viable, prosperous businesses, communities and industries. So that is something that we've got to make sure that we don't just approach things from a, you know, we're being regulated to do this, it's a compliance task, so it's more of a ticking fit as opposed to really thinking about what are we doing proactively. 
So the Bendigo and Adelaide Bank Group, um, we actually introduced Australia's first green loan product back in 2002. So we were a sort of early runner in this space and then took the foot off the pedal a little bit. Um, and while we don't lend to fossil fuel or native forest logging um, projects, and we haven't done for a significant period of time, we do support communities that rely on these sectors to transition uh, to low carbon economies. So we've got a lot of community bank partners that are uh, located in geographies that are reliant on those industries. And rather than saying we're not lending uh, full stop to anything in those regions, um, we are working with those uh, partners uh, and customers to, to support their transition uh, to something different. Our board approved our climate change policy statement and action plan uh, last year in, in June, and the board has oversight of our climate change action plan. And this year, I'm pleased we'll be publishing our first standalone sustainability report in October. And as you'd expect um, for the Bendigo and Adelaide Bank Group via our partnership with over 320 community banks across the country, we've been doing some really great social impact initiatives. Um, and even in various locations, really innovative uh, partnerships to invest in hydropower, wind power via local community organisations. So some of the, the risks and opportunities that we've been thinking about when it comes to, you know, as a financial institution um, and responding to climate change are things like higher compliance costs. Um, and since the Royal Commission, there have been a raft of compliance requirements uh, for, for financial institutions. Um, we are anticipating, like I outlined earlier, increasing regulatory and shareholder expectations um, to, to come. And that will increase the cost of, of capital and funding, something we have to, to factor in. I think it's, you know, we're also anticipating increasing in the physical risks leading to an increase in the credit loss, losses or credit provision uh, for financial institutions. Some of the opportunities which we have to put as, you know, an equal amount of effort into is if we're collecting you know, data um, on what we're lending to and the impacts, and if we follow the EU path, enormous opportunity for really great data collection that can, should be able to be utilised in many different ways. I think there are also, um, particularly in Australia, and we've seen across some fa you know, fabulous uh, uh, customers, various diversification opportunities for agribusiness customers. Um, and some of the carbon offsetting initiatives, wind farms, et cetera, um, that we all need to get more knowledgeable on. Certainly for us, there's an immediate opportunity for educating ups upskilling staff, which really has that flow on um, effect for engagement with our customers. So, you know, internally really uh, knowledge forums and, and learning programs is a priority for us to make sure that um, every one of our 6,000 staff uh, can talk about climate change and understand the implications, ramifications and opportunities that climate change presents for our customers. Um, like uh, Snow highlighted in the intro, there are you know, a number of green offerings that we're exploring from an equipment finance perspective, um, sustain sustainability uh, incentives around infrastructure and um, like what has been announced by one of the, the banks uh, last week, various incentives to support customers with their uh, carbon neutral ambitions uh, and their reporting in that sense. We've also been exploring things like various rainfall insurance policies uh, and products for agribusiness customers and trying to understand how can the bank play a role to sort of aggregate uh, some of the risks and opportunities for a cohort of customers and support them um, to weather out, pardon the pun, some of the highs and lows um, of that variability. We've been doing a fair bit of work um, surveying our customers um, and trying to understand what their expectations are of the bank and also what their needs are. And you know, it's really great that quite a high proportion, you know, 70, 80% are asking banks to actually really um, step up and play an active space in, in, this, in the climate change space. But more than 50% are also saying that they would like to understand more about the impact of climate change on their business and what some of the options are uh, that, can be, that can be undertaken. One of the great things that um, we're leaning into at the moment is uh, what's called the Global Gravity Challenge, 
which is a program with Deloitte and it's a global innovation uh, program where various innovators around the world pitch to respond to a challenge that we put out around equipping Australian farmers with climate management tools to build resilience uh, and strengthen their business viability. So we're working with some innovators from Italy um, as well as across Australia in trying to look at what are the what are the tools, what are the um, what's the space data combined with other data sources that can really bring something fresh uh, to our customers and us to understand some of the risks and manage those opportunities. So I might um, I might actually conclude there given the time and um, really looking forward to unpacking a couple of those uh, things uh, via the Q and A. And so given the time, I'm going to now uh, hand the baton across to Peter Grace uh, to talk a little bit more detail. And I'm sure the, the, the words of risk management uh, will continue to uh, be a feature in, in Peter's presentation as well. Thanks. Thanks, um, Alexandra. I will, um, that's a, a great talk. The, uh, I'll unmute, oh, sorry, I'm unmuted. I'll, uh, I'll share my screen now to give everyone an opportunity. I've, I um, see if I can get that up. I hope that looks okay. Look, I, what I would like to talk about now is um, the challenges that farmers uh, will be facing with respect to carbon accounting. Okay, carbon accounting, there's a big push globally and also with the federal government in terms of uh, soil carbon in particular. Soils uh, in Australia, uh, like in the world over, uh, are critical for food production. And, and soils do play a critical role in uh, where we're heading into the future. So I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit. The, um, I'll just move ahead here. So Australian agriculture, uh, where do our emissions come from? I know you've seen some of this through Richard Eckhart previously. The um, Most of our emissions come from uh, enteric fermentation, animals, but uh, agricultural soils play a key role in all of this. And most of the nitrous oxide that's emitted, and I'll get into that shortly, comes from agricultural soils. So 18% of agricultural emissions are soil borne. You can see here a, a multitude of emission pathways. Um, again, I won't get into all of them, we don't need to, but the interesting thing is the, the non-CO2 gases, um, mostly nitrous oxide and methane, these are permanent with respect to if you have an emissions reduction. When it comes to soil carbon though, permanence is critical to gain a carbon credit but permanence is difficult in our environment. Now, these are, this is just a list of what I just showed you there in the graphic. Uh, these are all the different pathways uh, of emissions that are accounted for by the Australian government and internationally reported. Uh, but what I'd like to focus on is the soil management area initially, and then talk about fertilizers and uh, crop residues. Now, how do we bring all this together? We have a common currency, uh, global warming potential, and we report everything as CO2 equivalents. And when it comes to carbon credits, uh, we're looking at soil carbon change in Australia and globally, and then methane, and then also nitrous oxide, bringing it all together into one single number, which is reported as CO2 equivalents. Now, globally, uh, we know that there, in the 1900s, uh, when agriculture first came into many areas um, and cropping, there was a clearing of native vegetation. With that clearing of native vegetation, you had a large release of uh, CO2 to the atmosphere. This is just a schematic uh, put together by Jeff Baldock, um, ex-CSIRO, which just, just gives you an idea of uh, potential magnitude of change. Uh, again, it, it is a sim uh, simplification, but you can see here, um, once we move forward and could see that we were declining in productivity, we had a switch in terms of, hey, how do we come back? How do we um, bring fer fertility back into our soils? So some people converted to pastures. Uh, that's the orange line you can see. 
and some people may have kept in cropping but moved into conservation tillage. Now, this is, this is what is the result of uh, our original practices. This is before conservation tillage. This is the Mallee. Now, this has come back. You can see on the right, um, you can see the vegetate, the original vegetation, and you can see how far, when you've ploughed this area, cultivated the area, how, how bulk density has dropped, carbon has disappeared, and the whole system uh, is in decline. So conservation tillage has been a key area, um, and the whole idea of healthy soils now, uh, as it says, the cornerstone of life. It's very quick to lose soil, which can be eroded and taken away, but it's very difficult to bring it back and accumulate carbon over. And with all of these uh, benefits, water, food production, biological diversity, we really, uh, we really can build society. Now, this is a slide many of you may have already seen. Uh, Albert Rivera, uh, a very revered soil scientist uh, from South Australia. Um, on the left, you see a, a, a paddock that has been uh, under conventional uh, cropping. On the right, conservation tillage over the years. And you can see after a rainfall event, it is totally different. Uh, there's ponding um, in, in the conventional uh, tilled area. The other side, no waters drain well. Now, conservation agriculture is very much a driver of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in the conventional side, there's been a loss. Uh, there's been emissions, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, all, all in large quantities. But then moving to the uh, conservation uh, agriculture uh, side, of the, side of the equation, you have CO2, nitrous oxide and methane all being taken back up by the system. So we want to be heading in that direction. Just going to run through here very quickly, um, some options that people in terms of farming systems. This, these are simulations based on real uh, validated models. And the example here is a 600 millimetre, uh, far, um, a 600 millimetre region and a clay soil. And uh, you can see here, all of them in terms of soil carbon, in the top 30 centimetres, the negative means that you have sequestered carbon. So whether it's grain, uh, including a grain legume, moving from pastures and then looking at sugarcane uh, in particular, you can see all of these systems can sequester carbon over a 20 year period if managed uh, properly. However, when you are adding fertiliser, you've got a negative in the balance sheet in terms of emissions to the atmosphere. And this is uh, just, again, um, you can see it quickly knocks out a lot of the benefits in turn. And people have to, have to use fertilizers in the majority of cases. Then when you bring in animals, uh, and we're not discussing that again today, but these are very conservative numbers of methane. So the last, uh, the last column in each of those five uh, scenarios is the net balance, is the global warming potential. And you can see in all cases, except for the grain, where the grain system, um, we, can, we have lost quite a significant amount to the atmosphere in terms of CO2 equivalents. So this is what we're up against. We're up against bringing these all down to a neutral situation, uh, a zero situation. Now, soil carbon is on the agenda well and truly by the federal government. But what I, wanted, like, what I want to show here is just one example of the variability in soil carbon across a landscape. And when you have variability like this, which is in most cases, it is very difficult then to be credited for that carbon if you are, are able to increase it. And you can just see here, if you look at the legend, it ranges from mid thirties, uh, sorry, yeah, mid thirties down to uh, 20, 21 tons of carbon um, per hectare in the top 30 centimeters, huge amount of variability, but this is pretty normal. Now, 
How do we get around this? The new technologies that are now coming through, instead of taking soil samples, what's the, what's the other way to do it? These are, um, soil carbon is the result of biological reactions producing CO2. So we're actually measuring CO2 instead and integrating that value across a landscape. Quickly, we'll just look at, have a look at um, the other areas. I've already mentioned nitrous oxide and crop residue decomposition. These are both sources of nitrogen. And you are, there, are two, there are two pathways for nitrous oxide. Nitrification, which is an aerobic reaction, microbial reaction, and denitrification, which is when you have a, a saturated soil or waterlogged soil. Just quickly here, just giving, providing an example here, you have uh, on the bottom nitrous oxide here, you have the water content, water contents drop, and you, you still get nitrous oxide emitted. But when you have increases in water content, you get a big flux in nitrous oxide. Now, where you need nitrogen as a source, where's that coming from? This is just an analysis using some data from FAO. You can see, um, whilst crop production has stabilized basically between 2010 and 2015 in this example, there was an enormous amount of nitrogen used. So we were in excess. Where was that nitrogen going? It wasn't being taken up by the plant. So it's available for losses to the atmosphere. You can see here that the majority of nitrogen applied in Australia is 90% of it is to cropping systems, mainly uh, the grains um, area. And these are just an example. This data is just an example of the losses of that nitrogen uh, that, that we can't find it. It's, it's gone into the atmosphere. Not, as not, not all is nitrous oxide, some of it is nitrous oxide. So where do we want to be? We want to be at this situation. We want to add nitrogen, but we want to get the yield right and we want to reduce the losses. So we've got to be at this optimal rate. What have we done? And this has been a federal government uh, investment uh, from about 2010 to 2017, the only country in the world to invest heavily in nitrous oxide emissions. We have this data. It's the best data set in the world. And we've been able to use it to take agriculture forward to carbon neutrality. Um, again, data sets from all over, the, all over the country. So bottom line, where do we go with uh, nitrous oxide? And I believe nitrous oxide is the key to cropping systems being carbon neutral. Fertilizer management, these, these are all basically what growers know anyway, but again, fertilizer is cheap and fertilizer is being uh, used uh, quite extensively. But again, we can pull back a bit. Uh, we can use enhanced efficiency fertilizers. Uh, that reduces the nitrous oxide emissions by 80%, uh, an enormous change. Uh, we put too much N on, we need to supplement our soil nitrogen supply. We need to put it on at the right time, not too early. We need to synchronize it with maximum growth and we need to get it into the ground and not on top of the ground, where the surface where it can be easily lost. So the, look, a lot of these are being done already. There's nothing really new here, except for these enhanced efficiency fertilizers, but they do come at a premium. They're about 20% more in cost. Um, we have developed over uh, recent years uh, reduction emissions reduction strategies where farmers can be officially rewarded with a carbon credit. This is in the cotton industry. Anyone that wants to pull back from 300 to 250 um, kilograms of nitrogen will be rewarded in terms of a carbon credit, but not many growers have come on board this. Fertilizer still is cheap and it is an uh, insurance policy. So I want to quickly wrap this up. Um, additionality is required for carbon credits. What I mean there is you've got to do something that you wouldn't normally do. And most people in terms of soil carbon have moved towards conservation agriculture. So rewarding soil carbon, you've got to look at different pathways. Spatial variability is a major constraint. Um, soil carbon is, non -perm is not permanent. Permanence is critical in terms of getting that um, return into the uh, greenhouse gas inventory and getting that credit. That's a hard one. There's a lot of N2O nitrous oxide information in Australia. We've used that to develop plan uh, strategies 
including the use of enhanced efficiency fertilizers. The way forward, well, there are measurements, as I showed, using systems like flux towers to give us a combined, uh, combine them with models. And globally, model-based soil carbon and nitrous oxide methodologies are the norm. We need to be aligned with them. So there is a way forward and it can be cost effective. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, any additional information you can find at this website. I'll hand back to Snow. Thank you. Uh, John Dixon will uh, ask the first question. Uh, thank you, Snow. And uh, I'm uh, very happy to uh, link together a couple of the numbers of questions that are coming in on the Q&A. And the, there is a very important question um, raised, first of all, by Georg Zellner, and that's about what proactive engagements and activities are taking place, um, thinking ahead to the next 30 years of movements towards carbon neutrality and specifically, and then a re related element from Pam Robinson saying what discussions are underway between government and agencies in relation to the types of farming that would be most suitable and most effective to moving towards carbon neutrality by 2050, given the different soil types and conditions in Australia. And I suppose that that uh, perhaps Alexandra might like to reflect on the, the proactive investments, particularly in relation, for example, to the types of innovations that are under consideration and Peter, especially on the farming types looking to the future. Thanks very much, John. Um, Peter, I'll go first, if you like, um, yeah. and just uh, expand on that investment piece. I think it's worth remembering that uh, a banks are only one source of capital um, when we're thinking about investment and uh, banks are often probably the most conservative uh, when it comes to uh, utilisation of their capital for something that's really uh, a little cutting edge, leading edge uh, compared to the private market. Um, certainly, you know, in my dealings with a number of farm businesses that are working towards net uh, zero, I think uh, some of the challenges are uh, being able to benchmark um, and understand where they're at and therefore what are the practices and technologies that they need to invest into that need capital behind them to enable them to get there and that goes to some of Peter's comments earlier around you know just whereabouts might you try and focus your efforts to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, I think there's also a question around you know if, if we're going to put proactive um, focus on uh, negative emissions technologies and infrastructure, where might that be, what scale? And if I reflect on it from a, a Bendigo Bank perspective, our focus has very much been um, with local communities and, and supporting a local community rather than something very large in scale that will support a state or a major city. So we've been investing in um, community solar programs, uh, community hydro programs where you can feed back into a local community to, to basically get a, a net zero uh, outcome. Um, and then the, any of the profits generated by those community uh, energy initiatives actually get reinvested back into community as well. Um, so there are fit for purpose and different scale approaches for investment. And I think banks are, um, you know, won't be the leading edge when it, it comes to investing in, in something that's really cutting edge but there are other capital markets that are really excited and you know, chomping at the bit to invest in really um, leading edge uh, technologies and opportunities. And then we have to think about scale. So what are the scale of initiatives? Um, if we try and solve really big chunky challenges, I think that the risk of failure puts many investors off. If we can um, think about different scales and local community scale, farm business scale, and the investments that are required there, then that actually opens up um, into the risk appetite of different investors and banks, um, more opportunities. So that'd be um, you know, some of my thinking around the investment uh, piece. But over to Peter for the second half of the question. The, um, just to talk about 
uh, people talk, just to talk about if people are talking and where this is all heading. heading um, there is a soil strategy that the Australian government has been putting together for quite a while now. And they keep uh, bringing up numbers that there's going to be X invested. There's been a lot of workshops I've been involved. A lot of people have. But uh, as you probably can realise, the pace of government in certain areas is slow. And uh, the recognition that soils are important just for productivity alone um, is critical in making this all happen. Uh, um, I think I think there is a genuine um, in the industry wave behind a lot of this. Um, the rural development corporations all seem to be on board. They have their own uh, climate change group as well. Uh, some are more on board than others. I know the, uh, the grazing industry, and just from the data I showed, um, you'll see that methane, methane is, is a significant uh, emitter uh, in or a significant source. So uh, the grazing industry has, as Richard Eckhart would have touched on the CN or carbon neutral 2030 investment, that, that is a significant investment, which has got a lot of industry involved. And, and MLA do have some very interesting investment strategies. Um, other, other um, as long, the key to this is, and I think uh, Snow can comment on this, as Snow has also had a lot to do with the ag sector and the government. Uh, all of the people we've been involved in in the government uh, up until up until now have, have basically said, hey, productivity and emissions reduction must go hand in hand. You cannot have, se you cannot separate them. If you can't grow and you can't grow sustainably, um, we're not going to move forward. And, and I think that's that's a great attitude. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, just to make a very, very brief comment on what you've just said, as I said in my introduction, uh, you know, this initiative uh, in addressing climate change, uh, there are, as Alexander has sort of indicated, and you've indicated, Peter, there are risks in doing what we're doing, but there are also rewards and uh, the co-benefits of reducing methane uh, in livestock emissions usually is a conversion to productivity. And likewise, as Peter indicated, uh, the increase in soil carbon probably leads to greater productivity benefits in terms of soil moisture and general soil health than indeed any carbon credits you might generate. Uh, so uh, I'd like to now sort of ask a question that's popped off my Q&A thing, but I remember it uh, is from Pam Robinson, who asked the question of what federal government programs are uh, around to identify the carbon sequestration and stability uh, capability of various soil types as a guide to farmers where it might work and where it may not work. Perhaps to you first, Peter, and then if you want to make a comment, Alex, Look, it's good. Just quickly uh, on that, um, soil type, if you've got clay, you, you're, you're, you're way ahead of the rest. Sorry, uh, anyone in Western Australia, including Ross Kingwell, who's on, I can see there, um, uh, sequestering carbon in, uh, on a sand is uh, very difficult. So uh, the, look, the numbers, the, the bottom line really is the real numbers for Australia. Um, there's been a lot of good soil sampling work done by CSIRO and other state departments, but we don't have the data in place like other countries. Uh, the United States have far better data in terms of soil uh, surveys, soil carbon modeling. We just don't quite have that. But again, um, there are depart the Department of Industry is heavily involved in this, the clean energy regulator, but the clean en energy regulator is more so wanting industry to come on board and get credits out the door. And um, th there's a bit of a disconnect there between some of the departments and the regulator. I think they're all trying to do the similar, but on the other hand, you need hard data for a lot of this. Alex, I think, um, yeah, if I can add a comment there, um, certainly the data uh, issue perplexes uh, the financial uh, institutions as well. And, um, and having a consistent methodology. So, you know, our cry to the science community um, would be to 
align and agree a, a common methodology that uh, enables different scales to sort of cascade up so that we can understand our portfolio risk and then report to shareholders, regulator, et cetera. So that the data um, is absolutely required for us to be able to back the right things and develop the right products um, and the right audit that will enable us to incentivize or reward those who can actually then um, you know, manage their carbon footprint, whether it's through soil carbon um, emissions from livestock, et cetera. But there does seem to be a plethora of methodologies uh, and it therefore is challenging for a, for a bank to sort of look at what are we going to reward and what's the audit um, or confirmation that this is a, a robust benchmark and we can actually utilise this across farming systems and across different business types. So that the data request is a real one. Okay. John? Um, just building on that, uh, Alexandra, uh, there's, a, there's a question as to whether the Rural Bank actually anticipates uh, the development of individual farm business greenhouse gas calculators which can then be used to benchmark businesses moving ahead in different industries. So mm. that, then Peter might like to also comment on the feasibility and stability of such calculators. Yeah, um, look, something that allows an individual farm business to be able to measure and report um, on their, uh, you know, their carbon uh, benchmark their emissions is absolutely you know sort of the the holy grail and then to be able to ensure that we can aggregate and understand across uh, geographies and industries what that looks like um, I know that there are uh, I know in Victoria the Victorian government has announced a pilot program to fund about 250 uh, farm businesses to have a uh, emissions audit on farm and again, that the investment required to actually understand what the baseline is, let alone then um, understanding within the particular business, what are the actions that will achieve the best outcome? Um, and then how do we make sure that there is an easy uh, audit and uh, a reporting process so that people aren't having to add administration uh, on top is something that yet has to be worked through. So we, you know, we haven't quite got it right at a farm scale and at this point in time, it's really hard to aggregate it and, and look at it um, at an industry scale as well. Peter, did you want to add to that? Uh, look, no, not really. It, um, just in terms of getting data together and that, it's, uh, there are a lot of calculators out there. Uh, most of them are based on uh, international information, Australian information. It is, it, but again, there are, it, ease of use is, diff, it, it, is, the, is the problem sometimes as well. Peter, well, uh, there's a question here from Michael Godden, uh, uh, which notes, you know, the enormous amount of elemental nitrogen that sits above every hectare. Um, and uh, how do we, rather than adding it from fertiliser nitrogen, how do we access this night? Do we need to grow more legumes and allow soil biology to access this? Uh, what are your thoughts? No, uh, I think, look, definitely we want to move to a world where there's less synthetic fertiliser. But again, um, in terms of if, if I just want to look at greenhouse gas emissions and say nitrous oxide, legumes produce nitrous oxide. So um, because of the decomposition process. So when we talk about nitrous oxide being produced, you have um, it has to be a nitrogen source and it can be fertilisers or it can be the crop residue itself. So legumes themselves do produce nitrous oxide. But again, but again I, obviously we want something that is more uh, sustainable, more, more natural. Um, you are, you've got a system with grain legumes where you're promoting growth of the next crop as well, obviously. So um, look, it, it, it's a difficult balance at the moment, um, definitely, all four going for legumes, we have to be, it's, it's the only way forward, but we still have to, uh, the, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, nitrous oxide, the jury's still out. We still need more work on, in that area. Thank you. Um, John? 
Yes, thanks, Snow. Um, there's, there's a couple of important questions around the concept of additionality that apply both to Alexandra and to Peter, I believe. Huh? Um, Robin Batterham has, has come in with a question about whether payment systems or conceivably uh, financial or lending arrangements might be adjusted to recognize progress towards uh, improved soil carbon or other carbon on the farm, for example. And then we have a from a sheep farmer in West Australia, um, a question around additionality too, that um, how it relates to markets and reporting mechanisms and how progressive farmers could be incentivized over less progressive farmers. So Alexandra, perhaps first. Yeah, thanks very much, John. Um, look, I think uh, certainly last week, I think it was Commonwealth Bank that announced uh, that they are incentivising and rewarding um, mm. a, a, an agribusiness customer for their ESG um, progress. So we are seeing um, that banks certainly, when it comes to assessing uh, the credit risk of a particular business, if there are strong sustainability practices on farm, that they um, have a demonstrable plan and, are, and can actually provide evidence of progress from a, a carbon and emissions perspective, then that does influence the credit rating and therefore the pricing for an individual business. Um, I think the challenge is, um, and for our, our WA uh, member as well, is that um, sometimes it doesn't necessarily drive any greater profitability from a um, uh, from a, a return on your capital perspective. As Snow highlighted earlier, many of the practices make good business sense when it comes to you know, animal productivity and getting productivity from a pasture, et cetera. Um, and those same practices uh, are positive from a emissions and, and climate perspective. I think the challenge when it comes to being able to incentivise and reward is that we need data um, and reporting that provides confidence that that is not a, you know, a one-off and that there can be the sort of the evidence chain to be able to back that um, reduction in risk from a bank's perspective because that goes through to pricing. If I reflect back on an earlier question, that the benchmarking piece and being a, the more we can have aligned and common methodologies utilised at a farm scale, I think when... You know, farm Management 500 discussion groups historically used to talk about financial performance and profitability of a business and they shared information and they compared and they discussed why someone was more or less profitable than others. Just imagine if we were able to do that and we had discussion groups that were around sustainability and uh, carbon and emissions uh, metrics and therefore we were talking about, well, what was one business doing versus another to actually drive a reduction in emission or an increase in soil carbon, et cetera. Um, that takes it beyond just the financial output, but then starts to have real, you know, benchmarking means that we're all slightly competitive in the human race. And so when you uh, open up and compare and benchmark yourself against others, you can see where you can improve and who to talk to, to get the knowledge and insights to do that. Um, I think from a, a reputational perspective, I saw a comment there from Brian. Um, if Australia doesn't proceed to have stronger um, climate accounting and carbon accounting and reporting, then we will actually be disadvantaged as a country and, and our key industries when competing in the international markets where they're expecting every farm business, every business, uh, irrespective of what's the, of the sector, to be reporting on their climate impacts and their, their climate from, um, contributions. And Peter, any... Yeah, I think uh, everything that uh, Alexandra said, uh, well, I totally agree with. And the, um, the idea of a sustainability index or, or something like that, I know uh, some banks have used uh, natural capital as the way forward. Again, uh, as Alexandra said, we, how do you account or, or what's, the, what's the language? And, and that is difficult. But again, sustainability uh, is a multitude. We've got an investment at the moment. Um, I'm just talking about with, through MLA, 
and who have invested with industry, uh, including people like McDonald's um, and some other companies, looking at biodiversity, looking at water quality, looking at carbon. So they're, they're wrapping it all into one as a, as a sustainability project. And, uh, but again, we don't have a metric for this, but we desperately need it. And um, as, as uh, Robin Batterham has mentioned there, should we be discounting, providing a credit and potentially at a discount? Uh, yes, I think that that's one way forward, but I think you've got to wrap it all together in terms of ecosystem services and uh, what it can be delivered. Uh, again, there is, a there is a language barrier. Thanks, Peter and Alex. Uh, look, uh, uh, an important question, uh, both from Paul Wood and from Nick Austin from Gates, who sent his greetings, Peter. Um, and that is, um, there are differing uh, global warming calculations, which of course depend on the half-lives of the different gases. Uh, and it affects the answer you get depending on what half-life you use or what actual time period you use. So Nick asks, and I think Paul was intimating this, uh, are we measuring the right things to drive the right decisions in agriculture. The um, <laughs> I won't delve too far into methane because that's where this is all coming from. Um, you'll have to ring Richard Eckhart to talk about that. But uh, I don't know whether if Richard uh, dipped his toes into the water because yes, but definitely methane is a short-lived gas compared to nitrous oxide. Unfortunately, nitrous oxide is a long-lived gas in the atmosphere. So using the um, global warming potential of 100 years is quite legitimate. But again, I know there's arguments around methane and how it's uh, uh, and, the, and using a, um, a shorter global warming potential, 20 years um, is being pushed forward. I think, I think there are some legs in that. But um, again, I, I'm not an atmospheric chemist, so I, I, but I can talk about nitrous oxide and uh, and definitely 100 years, it's going to be there still um, in the atmosphere. Thank you, uh, John. We're getting close to running out of time. So I'll ask you to ask the last question and uh, thank our speakers formally. Um, but before I do, just to say to those of you who, uh, it's been a, a wonderful questions response and uh, we haven't got to all the questions, which I apologize for. But if our presenters are uh, uh, willing and have the time, I know they're very busy people, but we will forward your questions to our presenters and they might just uh, give you a, a quick response in a written form. So to ensure that everyone's questions were, were attempted. Thank yeah. you. Over to you, John. Uh, thanks, No. Um, there, there is a question about um, from Carolyn Wells whether we're um, expecting too much uh, from carbon sequestration, um, in, in suggesting that uh, below 500 millimetres of rainfall, uh, sequestration might be quite low, and also on sandy soils, which could be challenged. So is it that we only have uh, significant carbon sequestration that's measurable in high rainfall areas and with significant clays? Just a very quick answer to that one. Yeah, I, well, clay, clay is the key and uh, water, is the water content of clay. So over, we tend to think of over 600 mil is sort of the way to go. Um, but the bottom line is, um, and this is why the grazing industry has some, has some legs, is that small amounts over large areas add up. Okay, so don't, don't be too disheartened. Um, everywhere, but again, it's all, it, it's area. It's it's a spatial extent. Um, small amounts add up. Well, thanks very much, Peter. And uh, I'd like to extend a, a huge thanks to Alexandra Gardner and to Peter Grace, both who've, who've presented so well and also answered the questions very, very well too. I think the topic is a really important subject for all of us dealing with agriculture in Australia. 
and it, it leads us around that question of data, knowledge, and digital systems, and especially measurement, the accuracy of our measurement. So we'd like to thank you very much to uh, thank also the participants for listening in, for asking key questions, and we will get back to you as, as uh, Snow indicated. And uh, I'd finally say keep an eye on, on the ATSI website for future webinars in this series related to carbon neutral agriculture by 2050. Um, there is, uh, just as a quick heads up, there's a seminar coming, a webinar coming on the 1st of September on food and agribusiness that might overlap some of the questions we've discussed today. So thank you very much. And with that, the uh, webinar is closed.